a lesson. And if you have a Bible, I want you to go to 1 Peter, since we're dealing with Peter. I want you to go to 1 Peter and, and verse 3 and uh, 7 when you get time. And it says something, I'm paraphrasing really quick. It says, husbands likewise. It's all these things about being submissive in the earlier verses of the Bible. And all these things that the wife is supposed to do. And I want you to know something. Whenever you see all this stuff about what the wife is supposed to do, I want you to go back to Peter, 1 Peter 3 and 7 and remember that it says likewise. So everything she's supposed to do, you're supposed to do. And then I want to add something else to it. It says, husbands dwell with your wives. And I like it a little bit better in the King James in this particular sense. But it says, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Now, if you're spending time with your wives and you're not spending time with them according to knowledge, if you're in a committed relationship to your spouse and it's a relationship of ignorance, there's a particular problem there. Now, let me help you understand what I'm saying about uh, knowledge. Now, if you really look at the word husbandman, it really means gardener. So you're a husband and you have a spouse and so you're really a gardener. A gardener of what? A gardener of a vineyard. What vineyard? The vineyard of your wife's heart. That's your vineyard. You are that farmer. You are that planter. And here you are walking into the elements of her heart. There are some hard places there because she's had some bad experiences in life. And do you know when you marry someone, when you commit to someone, this relationship of the committed, do you know you bring all their baggage with them? Do you know everybody who hurt her, they're coming along with her? And those are some of those hard places in her vineyard. Those are some of those rocks and some of those boulders. And so when you begin to till the soul of her heart, because this is your duty, because you're going to dwell with her according to knowledge. And the reason you're dwelling with her according to knowledge is because you are a husbandman. And a husbandman is a gardener. And where's your garden? In the vineyard of her heart. So let's put all that together. So I want you to realize that there are some things in that life, in her life, that you are required to uncover so that the blessings of God can flow. Now the other thing I want you to look at this about knowledge. And let me make one other point where dating begins. Dating begins after marriage, not before marriage. Now, everything I'm teaching you is from a biblical perspective. It's from a spiritual perspective. Now, you may go someone else and they teach you from a philosophical perspective. But whenever you study with me, you can be guaranteed that you're going to get it from the biblical perspective. Now, you can choose to do and operate in any way you desire. But the role that God has me playing in your life is to share with you what thus says the word of God as it pertains to certain things aspects of everyday life. So, dating begins in the biblical sense after the commitment process. And the dating process is a process of discovery. And so it is in this relationship, and I think if you will, I'm talking to me now, I'm talking to me, if I will fix this portion, this relationship right here. Now this is number one. It's understood that the relationship with God is all the way up here somewhere. So, so, yeah, God would be one, and this would be two, and so forth and so on. But when we're talking about your human relationships, this is relationship number one. If your mother is more important than your wife in your life, there's a problem. If you spend more time getting to know other people than you do spending to get to know your wife, my friend, that is a problem in this area of your life, and it's going to start producing results. Now, I know I have to move on really quickly here, so let me tell you one other thing. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 2 when you get time, and, and I want you to look at verses... I want you to look at verses 22 and 23. There's an interesting thing here, and this is also for the context of life that we live in. I want to help you understand that marriage, the term marriage, can mean whatever you want it to mean in society. I don't have a problem with however you want to term it to mean. It's okay. You can term that two boards getting together can, can, can be called marriage. Two trees getting together can be called marriage. Now, that's your choice. Uh, a, a woman and a woman getting together, that can be called marriage. That's your choice. And you, you won't find many preachers saying this. I think you have the right of choice. And if America as a society says, you know what, we're going to give civil rights, we're going to give civil unions, and we're going to acknowledge this. Those are choices. 
And we all have the right of choice. Now, as a preacher of God's gospel, I have to give it to you what the word of God says. Now, one of the things you see, and I believe this, God took Adam, God took Eve out of Adam's rib. And Eve's process in Adam's life was to complete Adam and make him whole. Basically, it was through Adam, Eve that Adam was able to breathe again. And that Adam was basically, now for the first time, he was able to live. And so marriage is not someone that you choose to live the rest of your life with. Marriage is that person that you're saying you cannot live another day without. And that's what love is, and that's what marriage is. But God took Eve out of Adam's rib, and when Adam saw Eve, Adam saw himself. He saw that who completed him. So I won't have time to go in that too deep here. But I, want, I do want to put this in your spirit from a biblical perspective. From a biblical perspective, a rib and a rib makes a pretty good sandwich. A rib and a rib makes a pretty good sandwich. Over in, in Jacksonville, Florida, that's a real good place. When I go there, I love to eat. That's a place called Jenkins Ribs, and boy, they put you a couple of ribs on that plate, and they have that old yellow sauce that they put on there, and a couple of two slices of white bread. I know it sounds good already. And you put that sandwich together, and it eats real, real good. It's an awesome sandwich, and they open late as well. But let me tell you something. Two ribs. Now, rib in this sense represents woman. Represents woman. Two ribs, when you put two ribs together, they make a pretty good sandwich. But in the biblical sense, a rib and a rib does not equal marriage. A rib and a rib is not a committed relationship from the perspective of the biblical context. Now, I'm going to move on. We'll come back to that and some future lessons going on. But I, I want you to see that lesson there. Now, the second thing I want you to see, and I'm moving a little bit swift here. The first relationship I told you was the relationship of the committed. The second relationship... I want you to see is that of the contextual family. This is the committed family. Now, what I want you to see about this contextual family, God in his infinite wisdom and in his infinite love, he placed you into a certain context. There are some that are being born right now. There are some that were born at the turn of this century and they were born at January 1st at 12.01 a.m. in year 2000. And there are some that were born in 1976 and 1981. And scholars will put you in certain groups and maybe you're a part of the baby boomers. Maybe you're a part of Generation X. Maybe you're a part of Gen Y or these millennials as we call this new generation. And so that is a context in which God allows you to operate in. So, but it's not just a societal context. There's also a context of the family in which he places you. Now, one of the things God is seeking to cultivate in the earth realm is true love. Now, there are five words that represent love, I think, real good in the Greek. I don't have time to go over all of them, but I'll just kind of write them here in no specific order. You know, there's that Philadelphia love here. But the one we're going to deal with right now is agape. You know, that's that brotherly love. You scratch my back, I scratch your back, all that kind of good stuff. All right, but this agape love is ultimately on display in the contextual family. And sometimes it's very difficult when you grow up in a contextual family that operates with one of these, I call them human loves. These human loves. And all of these loves are conditional. It is very difficult to go into a committed relationship when the contextual family you know has operated in this type of love that is condition driven. Because God brings agape love to this particular context. And this is the training ground for us to learn how to love unconditionally. Now, one of the, the first commandment with a promise is commandment number five. And that fifth commandment says, honor who? Your mother and your father. 
And then you can go over to Ephesians chapter 6 and looking at verses 1 through 4. And it says that it might go well with you. That you might have a long life. So this is the commandment with a promise. Now the other thing I want you to see about this particular deal. The first four commandments are, are go up this way. And these are commandments that teach us how to worship God and how to deal with God and how to Shabbat God. Well, this commandment here is the, is the commandment that reaches outward, that deals and teaches us how to deal in internal relationships and teaches us how to operate in the context of family and connections and with other people and things of that nature. Well, family, the contextual family, is the foundation for it all. Why? My spiritual opinion. Why do we have alarm and divorce rates? Because we go to marriage with conditions. And when you go to that committed family, it is to be an unconditional commitment. But we've never known unconditional commitment. We've never known uh, unconditional love. We've never experienced agape love. And agape love says it's about God in me pouring himself to God in you. And I don't care what you do. You can do what you want to do, but you can't stop me from loving you. Have you ever tried to love someone and give them your heart and all they give you is hate in return? They just don't love you. And here you treat them right, you do all everything you can, and they just will not love you, they will not be a friend to you. But the reverse of that is also true. Someone can be nasty, they can be mean, they can be harmful, but guess what you can do? Boy, you can pour that agape love on them. So, now, how do we learn this? Parents, teach your kids to honor you. Single mothers, single fathers, teach your children to honor the absent parent so that it may bode well with them in life and they may have longevity of life and things of that nature. And so this contextual family is extremely important. And so in this context, we see a couple of things in this scripture. We see two sets of brothers. They are biological brothers. We see the context of the family. We see two sets of brothers. We see Peter and his brother Andrew, and we see James and John. These two brothers who are living life together, who are yoking up together. And so I want you to really, I don't know where you are, but if you're trying to apply this relationship to your life, and you're trying to do this to your family, and you say, I don't need them. Because all they do is put me down. All they do is talk about me. All they do is bring up the past. All, and they keep going on and on and on. I want you to tell yourself, next time they have it, Lord, thank you for giving me an opportunity to have agape love on display in my life. The next time someone in your family puts you down and bring up that nasty stuff, and they refuse to see who you are today, and they want to recognize you as, to, as who you were yesterday, and you know what I want you to do? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for allowing me to have agape love on display. Because if it was my choice, there's no way I would love them. But I know that you're operating in my life. I know that you're sitting on the throne of my heart because you are allowing me to pour out love to someone who doesn't want to receive it. And so I want you to follow that. This is very, very important. I'm going to keep moving because I want to take you through these four levels of love. And I hope I'm, I'm, I'm blessing you. I want you to, I want to, see, I want you to see these, uh, these uh, four families. It's very important. I believe, I said earlier, my thesis in this lesson, the way God gave it to me, is that the blessings coming down that pipeline, they can flow a little easier and smoother and faster when we have the right connections. And they kind of lock up, kind of like grease in the sink line. You know, that old boy that messed you up. And so it's like we have grease in our lines and we're trying to run this water out of the sink, but, but it cannot flow. Why can't it flow? Because we do not have the proper family connections. So we talked about number two was your contextual family. God placed you in a certain context. The third thing I want to talk about, we're moving very fast, we're talking about a church family. 